apocalypse was the sum of all anticipated catastrophes. Civil unrest, climate change, nukes, disease. The surviving inhabitants of Canada and the northern parts of the US organized themselves according to a mix of anarchistic, aboriginal and nomadic ways of living. The Sum is an RPG made by the French-Canadian artist Hugo Nadeau, who has this very early 2000s looking high concept web page. The project received support from the Canada Council for the Arts, which is an organization that funds Canadian art projects. As far as I can tell, this is not an NGO. So assuming the support was monetary, this would make The Sum the first government-funded Fallout mod. The idea that a state would finance the development of an anarchist Fallout total conversion was so incredible that I had to reach out to the author for confirmation. This is clearly the first government-funded Fallout mod that ever existed, in my opinion, he said. It is funded by both the Quebec Provisional Government and the Canadian Federal Government. Turns out both of these entities funded the project twice each. They paid for the development of English and French versions and for the series of online role-playing sessions. There is another interesting idiosyncrasy. The mod is bilingual in the English version, most characters will speak English, but a certain percentage, about one-third of them, speak French. There is no translation. The sum. You say all the right words. Are you... Are you trying to fuck me? This is the most unique Fallout-related anything I've ever seen, and it plays nothing like the foundation it's built upon, which is Fallout Tactics. It's one of the least popular Fallout games, so I guess I should explain what it is. Tactics is a 2001 squad-based spin-off game in the Fallout universe. It's extremely notable for being possibly the averagest game ever made. Instead of controlling one character, you command an entire squad of fighters, there is a world map travel mode, and the familiar special system is also present. It was even improved a little, now it has different trait and perk selection for different races. But the game isn't a proper RPG, the missions are mostly done sequentially. There is no dialogue system, tactics is not a role-playing space for you to tell your own story or anything like that. The game isn't average in the Angry Joe sense, 6 out of 10 average. Instead, it's a platonic form of averageness. I'll explain. In the millennial Fallout community, Tactics was never loved or hated. Frankly, it was rarely talked about, but it was never ignored. It even had a modding community of five people. There was multiplayer. Very few nerds played it. I was in a Fallout Tactics clan. We tried organizing matches in internet cafes and at LAN parties. It was pretty fun, I guess. But then everyone switched back to Quake 3, StarCraft and Counter-Strike. Who the hell wants to waste valuable time with friends on a game that is pretty fun, I guess. The game's graphics, the visual style was slightly different. In classic Fallout, items generally have realistic shapes and colors. They look like real things, mostly. Tactics graphics are more vibrant. The items in that game look like toys. The titular power armor design is a bat suit. The stylistical changes are not subtle, but on the other hand, it's undeniable that the Australian artists put a lot of effort in their work. Fallout games are known for punctuating action with Tarantino-style over-the-top violence. It's an important part of Fallout identity. It's technique. But the gore and death animations and tactics might be even more visually impressive than in the classic games. Not all of its ideas were bad. The Brotherhood Zeppelins were introduced in tactics and then reused by Bethesda in Fallout 4, which was one of the best parts of that game, IMO. And you could drive a tank, an M4. The game supports both turn-based and real-time combat modes, but most people play in real-time. The turn-based system is janky because it was never properly QA'd. So that's tactics. Not great, not terrible. If you look up the meaning of the word average in Merriam-Webster, there should just be a picture of the power armor Batman. Paradoxically, games like this are actually quite rare. But unlike Tactics, The Sum is an RPG, and it's anything but average.
The intro is just someone in a basement somewhere recording trash with their phone. The sum is explicitly defined by its creator as an art project. Art is something we consider to be valuable, so by calling his own work art, he is raising the stakes. Welcome to the real ass people aesthetic. This is interesting. Character portraits in RPGs usually depict conventionally attractive individuals without physical flaws, or when they are not, they are designed to communicate some kind of emotion or fantasy. These pre-made characters are just people. Their appearance doesn't communicate anything of the sort. It's like visiting a gym or a shopping mall. Every color, every shape, every age group. Real people are never video game normal. Everyone is a little weird. You might have noticed there is no create character button. The pre-made characters are archetypes. It's like selecting your background in the Age of Decadence if you played that. And each one of these archetypes is customizable. You can change almost everything about them, including gender and portrait. So if it is your wish to experience this game as a conventional Fallout guy, you can. There are some badass looking portraits to accommodate that. The Sum breaks new ground by being the first Fallout game with a not garbage trait system. Make a trans character, or a political radical, or an old guy who gains fewer hit points per level, but gets perks more often. Almost all these traits are good either mechanically or for immersion purposes. The skill system is very different as well. Handguns and rifles are two separate skills, like in the Sonora mod. Ability to read is a skill. Different characters begin the game in completely different parts of the world map, which is gigantic, the largest I've ever seen in a Fallout game. This guy is a post-apocalyptic barbarian who lives on top of a ruined skyscraper. He begins the adventure illiterate and disliked by everyone. I think the portrait is one of the devs. This character is a child. They start with a greatly reduced number of special points, reflecting the fact that their body didn't finish forming yet. And they always begin the game in this abandoned train yard with an elder who takes care of them. This person has a crippling disability. They're blind. They navigate the world with the help of electronic device. We're gonna play something more generic. An experienced road warrior type who suffers from occasional panic attacks. This is a Canadian game. I have a Canadian friend named Aiden, so that's gonna be our name. We specialize in pistols and have a generally balanced set of stats with an emphasis on agility and intelligence. And so we embark on a tour of post-collapse North America. The game wants us to decide where we want to live, but uh, this seems a little premature. Certainly don't want to settle in an abandoned industrial whatever the fuck this place is. A lot of explosives in these crates. Is this the flag of Iran? What does that mean? Online vexillologists, I need your help. Experience in this game is called autonomy, and character levels are called autonomy levels. Hmm. The state of existing or acting separately from others. The capacity to make informed, uncoerced decisions. A a hole in the ground reveals some kind of a facility underneath, but our character lacks the skills to enter. You probably noticed this already. The mod replaces the Vault Boy pictures with this new emoji aesthetic. It makes sense. This is a huge ambitious mod project, and most of the work seems to be done by a single person. So emoji-like graphics are easy to make, and you can't deny they're expressive. Crypt of Civilization. Is this a reference to something? I don't get it. We are too weak to defeat defeat the hostile raiders, so I just make them follow me to the opposite edge of the map and then maneuver around and loot their now vacant camp. They have a working vehicle in this improvised garage. That C4 we looted came in handy. Hey fuckers! As I've discovered, the Tactics AI is incredibly good at avoiding road vehicles. Eventually the raiders disabled our transport, but we extract safely. This random encounter is a... I'm not sure what it is. Like a military boot camp, perhaps? As I was trying to figure out this mystery, we get attacked by two humanoid robots who beat the shit out of us. We are not autonomous enough to tackle this problem yet. The robots are ancient cops. According to the timeline of the events, about a hundred years ago, the police force was both privatized and robotized, and at least some of the robots were advanced enough to qualify for Canadian citizenship. 
This very detailed and interesting looking checkpoint type location is actually another repeatable random encounter. There is definitely quite a bit of the familiar Modder's Megalomania in the sum. The locations are many times the size they need to be. The security system inside the facility is still active. The robots outside are disabled, but technically they're still alive, in a sense that we can't loot them, and the knife does barely any damage. We blow up a robot with C4 and collect a battery from the body. Electricity is one of the resources we need to manage, I think. The survival mechanics left me confused. The developer called their game a radical camping simulator. Water can be collected by crouching next to bodies of water. You can slaughter animals and harvest their meat. But there really was no reason to do any of this until just now. We eat some uncooked tea leaves found in this coffee shop and the hunger is gone. Maybe it's because of the character archetype I've chosen, or perhaps it's a bug, but we've been traveling for a few weeks and hunger wasn't a problem at all. I don't remember seeing trees like this in the original tactics, must be a new asset. The scavengers invite us to trade with them at their base, but uh, forget to tell us where that is. I think this is another pop culture reference I don't understand. The guy is loading crucifixes into his car. He invested in a dud product, he says. No one needs crucifixes, I guess. We pick one of them up. Huge crucifix. Right click to burn. Lighter required. Let's not. Cool train. To the south of this abandoned town lies the Great American Desert. We take damage just by being here. Let's get the hell out. Not sure why this settlement is abandoned, but I bet these guys had something to do with it. Time to return to our road warrior roots. We steal the raider's Humvee. The biome visibly changes from desert to arid to temperate. I believe we're somewhere around the Great Lakes area in the former US. In the lore of the sum, one of the catastrophes that reduced the world to its current form was rapid global warming. Well, that's an understatement. According to the timeline, by 2040 the planet warmed plus 14 degrees. In real life, scientists predict that the planet will warm 3 or 4 degrees till the end of the century. And even most catastrophic predictions usually don't go above 6 degrees. 6 degrees means that a large percentage of the planet's surface is no longer suitable for human habitation. 14 degrees is the end of most life on Earth. I don't think this number is realistic. Hey Fallout nerds, what is this location a reference to? Not sure if I should be ashamed or proud of this, but it took me around three seconds to figure it out. Gonna tell my kids this was Vic's shack. A dead person wearing red clothes and an overturned bike. The bike is an item we can pick up. Sioux, I believe that's how you're supposed to pronounce it, is one of the larger settlements in the game. Visitors rules, no cars, bicycles only, no guns, no physical or verbal abuse, no excessive noise, dogs on leash. Hi and welcome to Sioux, home of the Syndicate and the best place to trade in the known world. Fallout Tactics doesn't have conventional dialogue trees, you see. Communication is done either via environmental barks or via this non-interactive box. This is where we get introduced to the game's politics. Our city-state is organized mainly by the principles of late libertarian municipalism. This is an anarchist game. Let's talk about the theory behind this real quick. I promise it's gonna be no more than a few sentences. Anarchy is confusing because the word has two meanings that can be diametrically opposed to one another. Anarchy is a state of lawlessness and disorder. That is the common and the original meaning of the word. But anarchy, anarchism, is also a political philosophy that calls for critical examination of hierarchy and authority. And the society that emerges as a result of these practices might be, hopefully will be, the opposite of lawless and disorderly. Libertarian municipalism practiced in this community 
Christianity is a version of anarchism formulated by the American philosopher Miyure Bookchin, but my understanding of his ideas is superficial. Share our profits does not mean private property doesn't apply here. We found it's easier to let ourselves keep objects and equipment as our own. I believe this is called personal property. Our character specializes in handguns, so I buy a needler pistol and some ammo. It's not as powerful here as in Fallout 2. The travel music is fantastic. There are two different tracks, both with a strong identity. The artist's website has pictures of individuals playing, or rather, observing the mod at an art exhibition of some sort. It is a participatory, multidisciplinary show in which visitors are invited to play the game in front of others. The exhibition is accompanied by live performance by Antonio de Braga, music composer for The Sum. Private property, no trespassers. But do we even believe in that? Wait, Q? What does that supposed to mean? We'll never find out because we don't possess a high enough lockpicking skill to enter the building. The needler pistol is next to useless. Kind of hard to tell where tactics jank ends and the sum jank begins. Like what is our character firing at? Sometimes he would just shoot random objects for no reason. Crates with the Facebook logo in the warehouse area of an abandoned airport. We find a US passport on one of the bodies. It is a little weird to see real life objects placed into this colorful Fallout tactics world. But at this point I'm sufficiently immersed to not notice these kind of things. A minigun. Not practical for us to use this since we lack the skills, but uh, I love the look of the sprite, better than in classic Fallout to be honest. In order to gain knowledge from books, a character needs some points in the read skill. This collection of military literature also requires understanding of big guns theory. Snow. There shouldn't be snow anywhere in Canada or in the world with a plus 15 degree warming. A banner with a dollar sign and a bunch of incinerated bodies. May it serve as a warning to all capitalist vermin still out there. That's kind of dark. A secure bunker with a working intercom system. Whoever is on the other side tells us to fuck off. In a locker we found this thing. Strange object, probably a work of art. It's no longer clear who the author is. So collecting old pre-catastrophe art is a feature. Artists shit. Freshly preserved. Produced in 1961. I don't get it. Is this a reference to the fountain? No idea. In Fallout Tactics, the frequency of random world map encounters is tied to your frame rate. I understand the modders have a workaround for this, but sometimes it fails, and the game just barrages you with encounters one after another. A swastika, closed gate, watchtower, graves. Since there is no conventional dialogue in the sum, when it comes to storytelling, much of the heavy lifting is done via environmental design. The arrangement of objects, the items you find. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. When we discovered the swastika compound, I immediately thought about the Nazi meth lab from Breaking Bad. But unfortunately, I don't think there is anything to this place. An honest-to-god forest in a Fallout game. I think 76 might have a forest, but this is the first time I'm seeing something like this in one of the isometric Fallouts. This is the smallest and the most disgusting village you've ever seen, says the game. It's actually a reference to a reference. In Fallout 2 there was a rare special encounter called Unwashed Villagers Fighting a Spammer. The Unwashed Village was a posting community originating from the old Interplay Fallout boards. That was back in the 90s. Oh, Wow, people are still posting. Not a lot, but there is some activity. One of the larger settlements. The locals don't like us openly carrying a weapon. I am no feeble Christ, not me. He hangs in glib delight upon his cross, above my body. Christ, forgive, forgive. Shit, fuck. I vomit for you, Jesu. Shit, forgive. 
The message broadcasted over speakers is the lyrics of the song Asylum by English punk rock band Crass, who used to perform in the 70s and the 80s. When I saw the swastika on the wall, I thought that perhaps the meaning of the symbol changed over the centuries or something. But this is almost certainly a reference to the Crass logo, which was an amalgam of the Christian cross, the swastika, and the Union Jack. It's part of the band's style, symbols of authority, barrage of contradictions. Aggressive music used to promote what is ultimately a pacifist message. Down from those pious heights, royal flag bearer, goat, billy, I vomit for you. Forgive, shit he forgives. Do you guys like this as a concept? Is it smart? Is it dumb? Lifestyleism is an anarchist term popularized by the mentioned Murray Bookchin, and it refers to anarchists who prioritize cultural identity and aesthetic over meaningful politics. The terrorist community is mostly francophone. There is no translation. I like this display of artistic sovereignty. If you can't understand French, but you absolutely must know what the characters say, you can use your phone camera and an app like Google Lens to translate. This place has everything. A gym, a library, a giant kombucha. On the top floor of the terrace, there is this huge greenhouse where they grow their food, powered by the solar panels on the roof. A nightclub. Compared to the classic Fallout, the tactics engine is capable of displaying more sophisticated lighting, and it shows. Physical training room. From each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. You can't believe it! You took part in your very first group sex! It's not exactly as you thought it would be. Plus 250 autonomy points. This is kind of fucked up. There wasn't even a prompt or even a fade to black. I just clicked on this character to initiate dialogue. I'm not sure about the correct jargon, but this is a room for people to get high in a controlled environment. Have to say I'm extremely skeptical of drug use in the context of anarchist ethics. Like, won't be addicted to a chemical substance reduce one's autonomy. I wonder what's the story here. How did that car get in the pool? An isolated mysterious shrine made of hundreds of human skulls. Something is wrong. Your body feels like it's going out of itself. You are losing control. Get out of here! I think this is a starting location for one of the characters. We gather mushrooms and eat them uncooked. Still not hungry, even though we lost eight like a month ago. <coughs> Surprise ambush by a ruined dwelling black bear. That's quite a bit of XP. So far, we were getting most of our autonomy via exploration. The game rewards you handsomely for finding different locations. A lonely shack. Inside, someone called Another Bomber. In his inventory, a bunch of pipe bombs. Fat City, the biggest town we found so far. A three-headed pig with the body of a man, and above there is a picture of a burning car. The biggest functional library we've ever seen in one of these games. Unfortunately, our read skill is not developed enough to take full advantage of this place. The world map is bigger than in all classic Fallout games put together. A group is taking care of a large vegetable garden in the former city of Barrie. That's in Canada, so we are here. There are side quests in this game. I've never bothered doing any of them since traveling and sightseeing is just more engaging. This is an old gas station that's also a bar, a gang HQ and a vehicle repair shop. We can steal a car from them, but all the vehicles here are damaged. This is one of those private underground shelters. The game calls it a luxury survival silo. Jesus Christ, this place is covered in trash. The sum has a smell system, by the way. If something smells weird, your character will tell you. Gorgi is dead. My poor brother. The NPCs here are voice acted, but the voice lines appear to be borrowed from the original Fallout Tactics campaign. Ah, what trickery is this? No, it cannot be. You fools! She cannot be trusted. You have doomed us all! This community is open carry friendly, and for some reason many locals have spare suits of metal armor in their inventories they're willing to sell. 
I have no idea why our character decided to start shooting at invisible people, but nobody seems to care. The fad lab must be bugged. Yeah, dude, something is bugged. I like these Shady Sands style graphics. Is this new to the mod? I have no idea. This guy doesn't know how to read. We give him reading lessons, accomplished by clicking on the guy again. The game rewards us with autonomy points. The first side quest we ever did, I'm pretty sure. I know this place. One of the character archetypes begins their adventure here. It's supposed to be a formerly peaceful community that began raiding other settlements. Our first real battle. I forgot how satisfying the combat feels in tactics. It's these animations. Like I said, they are arguably even better than in Fallout 2. Look at that. This has to be a bug. And a hilarious one. Somebody added extra zero to their own slot on the experience table. Or even two extra zeros. Killing one of the enemies gives us ten levels of autonomy. Real super soldier hours. I'm not sure what to do next. We broke the game. Ottawa is another major town. God loves gays. I didn't realize this was a political game. Tricked again! Possibly the least post-apocalyptic looking community in the mod. Gizmos? Guys, Gizmo is alive in Ottawa. I ignored it until now, but one of the permanent objectives we have on our to-do list is to find a place to live. This is done by opening your skills menu and pressing this big huge button that shows up. I will live here for a while, says our character. And then the game ends. The people of the city-state of Ottawa accept you in their community. There is no main narrative. Exploring post-apocalyptic North America and finding a community you feel a sense of belonging to is the point of the sum. Well, that's that. Certainly the most original Fallout mod I've ever seen. Anarchist, state-funded, bilingual, one of a kind. A game about traveling, not a game about killing. It's quite an experience, but is it fun to play? Well, there is a good game in there somewhere, but it needs more work. The current version feels like an alpha release. If you have a high tolerance of jank, maybe try it out. The survival mechanics are supposed to be central to the experience, but halfway through the adventure I completely forgot they exist. Another issue is that the game The Sum is built on top of, Fallout Tactics, is itself very temperamental, even unmodded. I experienced crippling frame rate issues, had to make manual changes to the configuration file, lower my resolution to arcade 800 by 600 had to download and run suspicious third-party utilities and nothing worked the only reason this video is watchable if it's watchable is because of editing tricks the frame rate was still terrible and there is no reliable solution if you happen to know of one please make a steam guide the anime fallout tactics download section sent me on a trip down memory lane i used to do cough syrup with this guy that was more than a decade ago jesus fuck if you could wish into existence a TR-style huge community expansion mod for one game, what would it be? Well, let's see, it can't be Arcanum, because there is not enough lore. You know, I would love to see a real RPG made in the EVE Online universe. Back when I used to play, I absolutely fell in love with the world of that game. EVE is Icelandic Morrowind in space. Or maybe something Planescape, but it can't be on the Infinity Engine, and the Torment story is over. Big thank you to everyone who participated in the emergency wartime fundraiser via donations or retweets. The volume of donations was so large that we got our PayPal account restricted. 24 hours later, as I was about to cut the entire thing short, the account was working again and within a few days we hit our goal. Do you guys like unique content? Here is a short presentation on the full travel path a donation needs to take in order to reach the person we're trying to help. First, it goes from you to coffee because GoFundMe isn't regionally available, and from there, it's transferred to my PayPal account. After the money gets to the Russian digital banking system, I transfer the funds to the account of the currency broker, who is physically present in the war zone. There is no digital banking in the People's Republics, you see. No cards, no Apple Pay, no anything. All transactions are cash only. The individual we were raising funds on behalf of then has to physically go to the broker's office and take their cash, and then the process 
repeats three or four more times because we're gonna be doing this in batches. Is it really a good idea to trust a shady third party from a warlord-controlled internationally unrecognized terror state? No, that is a terrible idea. But the only other option would be to physically drive there with a bag of cash, which doesn't sound like a great plan either. Anyway, it is done. We did a good thing. Speaking of smuggling stuff into warlord-occupied territories... Welcome to the colony. See you in two weeks or so. Support the channel.